Thank you, Wendy. Welcome to St. Matthew United Methodist Church. I know you can't see me as I make my way up to the front here. I just want to tell you guys that we are so very excited that you are here today with us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to encourage you uh, to pay attention as, uh, uh, as Stephanie puts things up on our screen about starting your watch parties. Uh, forward uh, the email that I sent today to your friends and family so they can join us this morning as well and share, share, share out your Facebook live feed uh, with those on your list so that all can participate and join us in praising and worshiping the living King today. At St. Matthew, we are a Christ-centered family of grace where all are welcome. Uh, we are committed to becoming who Christ says we are Growing, living, and sharing God's love one relationship at a time. So I am so excited and glad that you are here. We've got a great message for you today. The music will be wonderful, all in an effort to recognize and love and worship and praise our living Lord and Savior. So with that, will you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we adore you, Lord. We sit in your presence. We sit at your feet, God, here, ready and willing to accept what you have for us, Father. We confess, God, that we are not perfect. We confess, Lord, that we have wronged each other, that we have wronged you, Lord. We confess, Father, that uh, we are not where uh, we may want to be with you, God. But, Lord, in that confession, we also know that the way you see us is much different than the way this world sees us. And so we just want to be and become who you say we are, not who this world says we are. In all thanksgiving, God, for your grace and for your love and for those that you have gifted us with and put around us, Lord, we give you thanks, Father, in the good and in the bad and even in the seasons where there's just not much going on, Father. Let us always draw our minds back to you and be thankful for the things that you have done. Father, we have needs, God. You know the needs of our heart, and you know them because you care about us, Lord. And so we can cast these needs, we can cast these cares upon, uh, upon you. And Lord, even if they seem so minor to us, they're not minor to you. Even if they seem so inconsequential, Lord, you care, Father. And so we do want to pray for uh, those that are being touched by the pandemic right now, God, as the, as the numbers rush and roar through the state of Texas and in our community as well. Lord, be with those families, God. Be with those loved ones, Lord. Be with our community, Father. And, and, and Father, we pray that your miracle and your healing would take place uh, in our land, God. Lord, don't let us waste this time, Father. Uh, this time of growing and this time of learning and this time of pause, uh, sitting in front of you, Father. We just want to open our lives and our hearts to you. Make our will your will. Make our hearts pliable, Lord, that to be shaped and molded into who you say we are. So it's with all that, God, as we come to worship with hymns and praise today that we lift ourselves to you, God. Uh, submitting ourselves to you. May your name be praised and lifted up this morning, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is number 380. There's within a, my heart a melody. There's within my heart swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus. 
Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him. Join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of inspiration this morning is number 382, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Thank you, Carol. That was awesome. <laughs> we were having a couple of sound issues earlier, and so we're adjusting that. But you should be able to hear everybody uh, clearly now. And so, uh, Misty, thank you for letting us know that um, as well. So I've turned it all up for everybody. So it's just some things that we needed to adjust and get together today. Uh, as we come to our offering time uh, this morning, let me just again tell you thank you continue to support this ministry guys uh you're making a difference as you give through the church uh, and i also want to encourage you uh that not only do we do our offering and money but uh, we offer ourselves out as a body of christ to our community and so though we are online still 
uh, we do go ahead and we just share where our feats are and our activities. So anytime that you receive an email from us with the weekly updates, feel free to forward those to anybody in your contact list. We would love for them to join us at Bible studies or uh, at our Zoom fellowships or uh, for our worships or our praise. And there's lots of content that we have posted on our YouTube page. There's tons of content that we have posted on our Facebook page. And guess what? We have our new web page up, and uh, uh, Stephanie is putting uh, that up for you right now. And so I know the link uh, is there that you can go out and you can check out the new web page that they've worked so tirelessly on and so hard on. Uh, for that. So all kinds of opportunity uh, here. Just a couple of things that I want to highlight for you that are coming up. Uh, the first is tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. And please, all ladies, come and join uh, Carol as she uh, gives a, a great teaching uh, at Women's Bible Study at 7 p.m. The Zoom information is sent to you. If you need that sent to you again, just email us or call us and we'll be happy to send that out. We will send out a reminder tomorrow um, as well. Uh, and then the second thing is, is that we just want to continue to be in prayer uh, for one of our ministry areas, which is uh, Aspen uh, Village, uh, right across the street from us. So continue to be in prayer. Step those prayers up this week uh, for those guys as well. There's nothing going on. I haven't heard anything over there. I just feel the need that we just need to really continue to reach out and, and pray for our brothers and sisters across the street over there, as well as everybody uh, in our community. Your giving makes a difference. Your prayers make a difference. So right now, if you haven't already done so, chat in your prayers so that we can get those to our prayer team uh, this week. And we do pray for you uh, yeah, each and every day. We have people in our congregation that are praying for you. I'm praying for you. Our staff is praying for you. So please uh, chat those needs in, those prayer requests. There's nothing too small that we can't take time to sit and join you in prayer. So uh, just love you guys uh, very much and thank you uh, for giving. You can give online, you can write a check and mail it in, or you can uh, call us. We have a care team that is absolutely wanting to serve you. These guys are absolutely awesome. So in, if you need us to come pick up the check, great, but not just that. If you need groceries or you need a prescription filled, you don't feel comfortable getting out or you can't get out right now. Um, then call us. We want to go. We want to meet you where you are in the Lubbock area, and we want to help you, and we want to serve you, and we want to love on you. So uh, for, you know, tiny church here, boy, doing big things, right? You know why? Because God is bigger than anything that we will ever face. He gets all the credit. Amen. So thank you guys for being such faithful and good, kind, loving servants to him and his bringing his kingdom to this world and join it with his kingdom in heaven. So and in, in light of that, let's just go ahead and let's come to our prayer time together. Will you join me as we pray silently? And we really want to pray for our community today. If you've noticed now, uh, before maybe the virus wasn't very close to home, maybe you didn't know anybody, but all of a sudden now we are starting to know people that are perhaps closer to us, and even in our own families, uh, that, are, that are getting the, this virus. And so just want to pray for everybody in this. You know, we're in this series right now about God, uh, you know, that we're wound up, and God is the great chaos coordinator. And today we're going to talk about more things that come against us during this time that's not too big for God to handle. But right now, let's just sit together uh, as a family and let's pray silently for those that are being directly touched, businesses that are being directly affected, lives that are being directly affected, families that are being directly affected, the medical community that is being directly affected, our city and state officials that are being directly affected, everyone that is just being directly affected uh, by this virus right now. So just join me as we pray to God silently. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, even whether we vocalize or we're not, you hear our hearts, you know our hearts, you know us better than we know ourselves, God. And so, Lord, we just, we just thank you for that, Father. 
Father, we do want to lift up those around us that are being specifically affected by COVID-19. Be with the families and those in our medical community. Father, those in, in, our, uh, in, in charge of our, our government, our local and our state and our national government, the leaders, the health officials, Father. Lord, we lift up the families that have been touched directly. Lord, and we just, we just pray for your healing and for your miracle, Father. And Lord, we thank you for the ways that you continue to work good in all things, God. So, Father, thank you for that. And it's in that thanksgiving that we can come to pray of what Christ taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, church family, for uh, joining me in that prayer today. And I would ask that we continue our prayers all week long uh, for our community and for our families as well. Our scripture today comes from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. And I'm going to flip back and forth between the message and the NIV and the New Living Translation. But I'm going to read the core of the scripture right now to you from the New Living Translation. So if you want to open your Bible apps or open your Bible at home and follow along with me, grab that right now and let's read this together. Verse 19, James chapter 1. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. Now listen to this. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you uh, for doing it. May God add his richest blessings and his mercies and all of his grace to the reading of his word this morning. So as you know, we're in a sermon series, a mini-series uh, called uh, Wound Up, God is the Great Chaos Coordinator. And today's sermon title is A Lit Fuse. Now, about what I'm about to talk about, you may have already watched this movie again during the season that we're in, but did you know that the coronavirus outbreak has inspired people to search for the movie Contagion? I don't know if you remember that movie. It's a nine-year-old film uh, that was directed by Steven Soderbergh, uh, and it's about a uh, flu pandemic. Um, Jude Law, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Matt Damon star in the movie. Now, uh, Contagion was the 270th most watched Warner Brothers film in December of 2019. And by March, after the coronavirus swept the world, are we okay, Steph? We, they still can't hear it. Okay, all right, hang on one second. We're going to get back to the movie. Let me make this adjustment. Okay, we'll see if, if that works better for them. Get a little bell mark on here. Okay, yeah. All right, can you chat? Guys, tell me, if, if, do we have the audio right now for you guys? We're going to wait just a second. I'm just going to talk a little bit. Uh, to be sure that we have the audio um, set so you guys can hear this at home. 
if you can, chat in uh, and let uh, Stephanie know the thumbs up that it's better. If it's not, then we'll continue to turn things up a little bit as we go. Everyone says good? All right. Hey, woo-woo, there you go. That <laughs> that's, that, that's me? Good, we can hear it. Okay, way to go. Okay, let me start over, all right? You may already have watched the movie again during this season, but did you know that the coronavirus outbreak has inspired people to search for the movie Contagion? a nine-year-old film directed by Steven Soderberg about a flu pandemic. I don't know if you remember the movie or not, but Jude Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Matt Damon, they star in this movie. Now, Contagion was the 270th most-watched Warner Brothers film in December of 2019. But check this out. By March, after the coronavirus swept the world, it became the second most watched Warner Brothers film of all time. Now on Google Trends, and I think that Stephanie's going to put this, uh, this slide up for you so you can see the graph. On Google Trends, though most of through most of 2019, the search term Contagion Movie, that search term ranked fourth in Google search frequency. Now that's a low ranking because 100 is the highest on that scale that you could possibly get for a popularity search, and one is the lowest on that scale. In January of 2020, check this out, there was a massive uptick in searches for the Contagion movie, that term, hitting 84th on the Google index in January of, uh, on January the 26th. Now, this is really interesting, by March, after the first coronavirus cases reached the United States this year and Americans had died from the virus, searches for the contagion movie term peaked at 100% popularity, the highest mark that you can have on Google's index. And so look guys, no doubt that the word contagious and forms of the word contagious is being used more frequently these days. And look, as we deal with this extremely contagious virus, it just makes sense that we are doing some things that we would normally, that we wouldn't normally do to be cautious, like wearing masks and social distancing. We are being more cautious and we are making more sacrifices and more concessions than ever to not accidentally infect somebody that we're around. But now here's the thing, guys. The longer that we live with this contagious virus, there seems to be something else that is just as contagious that is spreading. It's spreading to our homes. It's spreading in our relationships. It's spreading in our friendships. And it's the infection of anger. Now, I think that we're all feeling it a little bit more these days, rightfully so. We are wound up. You might not say it that way. You might not say that I'm angry. Maybe you'll say it like I'm tired or like I'm disappointed or like I'm frustrated or like I'm going right stir crazy from last week, right? See, it's hard to self-diagnose anger in our lives. We would really rather call it something else or admit it as something else when referring to how we are feeling ourselves if we're really honest about that. We don't have a problem saying someone else is angry, but when it comes to us, we are like just disappointed, right? And I just think it's important that we take some time to evaluate how we are doing this morning because it just takes one angry person to make those around that person a little bit angrier too. In other words, one person's anger will trigger another person's anger. Or let me say it like this. My anger could provoke anger in you, or your anger could provoke anger in me. So anger is very, very, very contagious. Now look, if you're watching us, this live stream, together with us, uh, and, and you're around other people right now, caution. Now, don't make eye contact in the next few moments, but let me just tell you this. You may be around a carrier. <laughs> and guess what? You may also be the carrier. Uh, uh, the way that anger works is, is that it just affects everyone around us. 
Dr. John T. Cassiopo, who I have read tons about since the early 90s, he was the founder of the Center of Cognitive and Social Neuroscience at the University of Chicago. Uh, he died in 2018, by the way, but he would explain it this way. He says emotions are actually more contagious than the flu. This dynamic is so powerful that in one study that we did, this is him talking, we had three volunteers sit silently in a circle for two minutes. Now, at the end of that time, the most emotionally expressive person transmitted his or her mood to the other two without even saying a word. He went on to say, in every such experiment, in every such session, the mood the most expressive person had going into that room became the mood of the other two when they came out of that room. So see, whether it was happy or whether it was bored or whether it was anxious or whether it was anger, it was contagious. One person's anger triggers another person's anger. If you don't believe it, just go to the comments section of some controversial Facebook post or any news article on any website, and you'll see this dynamic really at work. By the way, the comments section, right, that's where the angry people mostly live anyway. And it's in that comment section that if you spend a little too much time there reading, guess what happens? You're probably going to catch the infection of anger too, right? You may read something that you agree with that someone else doesn't agree with. You may read something that you don't agree with that everyone else agrees with. Whatever it is, you'll find that the anger just starts to spread in you. Now, look, it shouldn't be surprising for us that during this season, anger spreads just a little bit more quickly, right? I mean, before this, if you were frustrated or if you were irritated, you could bury that under an overcommitted schedule or if you were hurt or disappointed, you know, or you were bitter towards someone, you could bury that under a pile of get-togethers and cookouts and sport activities or school activities or church events, right? Right? But now we've this stillness and we've this amount of space that we're not maybe used to in all this time on our hands. And in those circumstances, I just thank, guys, in that stillness, with that space and with that time on your hand, stuff just comes to the surface. And when those emotions come up, they almost always look and they almost always sound like anger. Now, through Scripture and through recovery, here's what I know about anger. Anger is usually a secondary emotion. So think about anger as the indicator light on the dashboard of your car, okay? When that light turns on or begins to flash, it is telling you there is something that needs attention or something that is wrong underneath the hood. In other words, there is something else that is triggering that light. And if you want that light to stop flashing, then you need to address what's under the hood. Unfortunately, in America especially, what we think is we just need to turn that light off at the light on the dashboard, not at the problem under the hood. The dreaded check engine light, right? I mean, I wish we were all here together because I would ask this question. Raise your hand if your check engine light was on this morning when you came to church, you know. Auto stores and thousands of things have been posted on the Internet that have all sorts of solutions to get the check engine light to turn off on the dashboard without addressing the problem that it's indicating. See, the error is, is that we think the check engine light being on is the problem, where the truth is it is alerting us to the problem. So if we really want that light to stop flashing, okay, we need to address what's going on under the hood. That's how we truly unwind. And that's when we get so wound up, that's what we need to do to unwind is address the problem. It's not by focusing on the light. It's by focusing on what's underneath. So 
Maybe you feel angry, okay? That's the indicator light that's on your dashboard. But what's really under the hood is fear, perhaps. I've heard it described before. Anger is fear in a leather jacket. Some of us are dealing with a lot of fear right now, perhaps. You're afraid that you're not going to financially be able to recover from this, or maybe you're afraid what kind of impact uh, this season is going to have on your children or your grandchildren. You're afraid that maybe all the work that you have put into your business is going to be for nothing because of this. You're afraid for the safety and well-being of others. You're afraid of, that you're losing your rights or you're losing your lifestyle or you're losing your groove. Your way of living is being threatened and it's, being, uh, it's in danger. And see, here's the thing about feeling afraid. Feeling afraid just seems so weak to us. It takes a lot of vulnerability to tell someone that you're scared. In fact, that's a scary thing right there, to tell someone that you're scared. So instead of this fear surfacing as fear, guess what? It surfaces as anger. But look, it's not just fear. It could be underneath the hood is regret, or could be underneath the hood is shame. And, and since you've paused and since you've been made still, maybe you've been a bit more contemplative and introspective and have taken stock of your life and, and your priorities, and, and you have just some regrets there this morning. And you know what? Those regrets, they can come out as anger. And it's the type of anger, really, that typically blames others around you for the way that things are going now. Maybe what's under the hood is fatigue or exhaustion or frustration. I mean, I, I really am truly, personally, I'm so tired of all this and so done with all this. I mean, it's, it's just like some days, uh, everything seems like that it's a source of irritation. Now, I don't know if this is true specifically of you or your home, but, you know, I've just noticed this surge in anger in visiting with others and praying with others during this pandemic, you know. And, and, and I just think a lot of us are struggling with this, and, and more so than before all of this began. Maybe in your home and your relationships, you're seeing more explosive reactions and destructive responses than usual. So for the next few minutes, you know, I, what I want to do is I just want to talk to you about anger, but anger specifically in the context of our relationships. So for this, uh, we go to the New Testament book of James. Now, a little bit about James. Y'all know that James was the son of Mary and Joseph, which made him the half-brother of Jesus. Now look, just imagine having Jesus as your half-brother. For instance, <laughs> Jesus being talked about as the Son of God. I mean, can you imagine that? If someone started talking about your older brother as being the Son of God, dude, I mean, that is seriously a lot to take in, isn't it? And you know what? James just didn't buy it at the time. And James thought all that was around Jesus, including all that Jesus was saying as well, was just simply crazy. And he didn't believe it. Mark 3, 21 really reports this. It says, and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, talking about Jesus. His family went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. His own family saying, he's out of his freaking mind. We've got to pull him off the street, right? Some of you have been there. We don't want to talk about that. Maybe I've been there before. Not the same thing that we're talking about now, right? John 7, 5, it admits this. It says, for not even his brothers believed in him. But see, then James knew his older brother was nailed to a tree. And it's not very clear if James was at the crucifixion or not. You know, so, but it, at least I know that he knew. He may have seen it, but I know that he knew his brother was nailed to a tree and crucified. And, and, you know, maybe James helped comfort his mom with John. We don't, we don't know if he was there or not. When her oldest boy was put in that grave, was buried in that tomb. And then three days later, James' older brother, he shows back up. Now, we do know this from Scripture. Jesus comes back on the scene, and guess who he appears to? Lots of people, but specifically mentioned is James. 
And from that point on, James was all in. James was committed to telling people about his brother, about Jesus. But guess what? James also lost his life for telling people about Jesus. So the book of James is written, guys, for people who are really followers of Jesus. Now, these, this specific audience, when the book was written, they were experiencing incredible pressure at the time. Many had lost their jobs and their homes. Many were separated uh, from their families. All of them were facing these uncertain futures. There was a lot of frustration. There was a lot of fear going on in them. There was a lot of disappointment that they were experiencing. There was a lot of anxiety that they were having. But notice where James takes them and what he talks about to them in the very first chapter of this letter. He talks to them about anger. And here's how he starts in verse 19. He says this, Understand this, my dear brothers, and sisters so i'm just going to stop there for a second because i want to talk about that so so what james is doing is before he talks to them about anger specifically he is reminding them about their position and their status with each other in their relationship he is reminding them that they are brothers and sisters that they are a family in other words he's saying hey man i know that there is some anger here going on here with you guys i know that there is some tension in your homes just remember this you are brothers and sisters all with the same daddy all with the same father right now listen if you're a parent of siblings <laughs> this language sounds very very familiar to you and you can probably completely understand what james is doing here I imagine this guys this scenario maybe you were there a, a couple of months ago you're unexpectedly homeschooling your children again <laughs> okay <laughs> say that they're sitting at the same table in this scenario the younger one keeps touching the older one now what's the older one doing right the older one is getting frustrated and the older one is getting angry and so, as a parent, what do you do? Well, you do what all parents would do. You address it by drawing the imaginary line, right? <laughs> oh, the good old imaginary line trick, right? That approach, such a great idea. Guess what? Never works, does it, you know? I mean, it's probably been used since the beginning of families and the beginning of siblings living together, I'm sure. But I doubt that it has ever worked, no matter how far back you go. Now, if that's not working, you know that you can't threaten to send them to their rooms. But because you know that's where they really want to go and that's really where they want to be, they want to sit in their rooms unmonitored so that they don't have to do their schoolwork. So they keep fighting and they keep touching and they keep arguing. And so finally you say, and guess what you say, who you say it to? Finally you say to the older one probably, who is really probably more annoyed than anyone, hey, that's your sister, or hey, that's your brother. In other words, what you're doing is you're telling the oldest, you're saying, you may be right, but the relationship is more important than you being right. The relationships matter, matters more than you getting what you want or you getting what you think you deserve. See, that's what James is doing. He's starting there with these guys. He says, dear brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, and then he goes on and he gives this command to them. He says, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now look, I, I like the way the message paraphrases this. It says this, lead with your ears, follow with your mouth, and let your anger straggle along in the rear. It just feels like when I read that in the NLT and the NIV and the message paraphrase, it just feels like it's part of a life application from the Oprah show, right? Or it's a relationship tip from Dr. Phil, like a, like a best practices for relationships. You must be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry, right? 
But really, guys, it's more than that. It's not a suggestion, and it's not a tip. It's not a best practice. This is a command to those of us who are followers of Jesus. And look, not only that, but there are really no qualifiers here. And man, personally, a part of me really wishes that there were qualifiers, you know. Uh, A part of me wishes that James would have said, hey, you have to be quick to listen, and you have to be slow to speak, and you have to be slow to become angry unless the person you're talking to is not making any reasonable argument whatsoever. Or unless the person that you're talking to is being really, really super annoying. Or unless the person you're talking to is on the other side of some theological or political issue than you are. Or unless the person you're talking to, you've been around way too much the last three months, right? But unfortunately for our human behavior, there are no qualifiers here. James just says this. You must all be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Then James gives the why in the next verse, in verse 19. uh, 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 The why of verse 19 in the next verse, in verse 20. And here's what he says. This is big. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Human anger doesn't give you the kind of life that God wants you to live. Human anger doesn't allow you to experience the kind of relationships that God wants you to experience. Human anger, guys, doesn't let you have the kind of relationships that God wants you to have. And so, look, as we talk about this, I know there are a few of you that are just like me that picked up on that phrase, right? Human anger. And you may be like, okay, Todd, I don't know exactly what you mean by human anger, anger, but I know this. I don't yell, and I don't scream, and I don't cuss, and I don't call names, and I don't throw things across the room when I get angry. So I doubt that my anger is as damaging as those who throw a fit. Well, maybe that's not what you do when you get angry. Instead of that extroverted kind of anger, maybe you become manipulative and you express your anger by making uh, everyone else, you know, kind of see you as the victim and trying to get them to feel sorry for you. Or, or maybe instead of yelling when you get angry, you become sarcastic and you become super critical. You know, by doing anger this way, you can say hurtful things all you want and then cowardly hide behind such lines as I was just joking or I was only kidding or what's wrong with you, lighten up, good grief, you know. Why are you so teed up? Don't be so sensitive. You know what? Maybe instead of throwing stuff, you become passive aggressive in your anger. Like you withhold attention and you withhold affection and encouragement until you get the attention that you want or the person has paid enough for what they did wrong to you. Then when someone asks you, even in this, hey, is everything okay? What do you say? I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. I'm good. (laughs) I mean, are there any real people out there today, right? Any stonewallers? Any of you guys stonewallers today, you know, when you get angry? You know, where you withdraw from that person? (laughs) You ignore them? You give them the silent treatment? Oh, man, I hate the silent treatment. I absolutely cannot stand the silent treatment. I mean, I think that is just one of the most cruelest forms of anger ever to be expressed in a personal relationship. So look, maybe you don't have this short fuse that leads to this huge explosion, right? Maybe you're more composed and seemingly calm and collected in your anger like uh, like a silent assassin. You don't make much noise, but man, the body count of people who've crossed you is undeniably significant. Look, guys, no matter how anger comes out of you, the burn is the same inside of you. 
The damage done by that anger is the same inside of you. The separation created by that anger between you and your brothers and sisters or you and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the same inside of you. So to all of that, James says this. No matter that, he says this. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Think about it, guys. In all of our anger, what tends to to drive that inside of us anyway. Well, for most of us, I believe, we become angry because we're right. We're right. And we know that we're right. And we want to be recognized as being right. So oftentimes, guys, we come at this crossroads, this decision point that we have to uh, make. And in recovery, they say it this way, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? James says it much better. He says it this way. Do you want to be right or do you want to be righteous? Not self-righteous, but godly righteous to each other. And look, that is just a really super tough choice for us, isn't it? I mean, you must choose between being right or being righteous. I mean, even as I say that, some of you are already arguing with James over that in your head by saying, but you know what? I was right, or I am right. I mean, think about the last argument that you had, the last time that there was some tension in your relationship with somebody, and guess what? You probably think you were right. And then everyone that you talked to about that, when they heard your side of the story, they agreed with you. They said, you know what? You are right. See, it, it, it's just hard for us choosing to be righteous over being right. But it's a great question for us today, so I'm just going to ask it right here. Here's the question. Ask yourselves this. Am I going to be right today, or am I going to be righteous today? Now, look, because this really isn't easy, James wants to help us understand how we can grow this inside of ourselves, this being quick to listen, this slow to speak, and this slow to anger. So he says this. Here's a few things that you need. And in 21, he lines it out for us. He says, you need to get rid of all the filth, and you need to get rid of all the evil that's in your lives. Now, that seems like, wow. I mean, how did you go there, you know? Well, remember this. He is talking about this in the context of anger. And guess where anger usually pours out of us? Our mouths. <laughs> so James is really framing get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives in the context of our speech. How we talk to one another in anger, how we speak to one another when we get angry, how we address one another disrespectfully. He says... Get rid of all of it. And the language here is not this judgy or this cruel or tyrannical language. Rather, the way he's saying it is this grace-filled repentance language. You know, it's the idea of having worked all day in the field and coming home to find a cookout going on with neighbors and friends and everyone's dressed so nicely in their summer clothes and the lights are on, you know, on the patio and you can smell the barbecue and you walk into this gathering with your sweaty, dirty shirt on and, and you just know that it's stinking up the room, right? So you need to go change. Now, because your shirt is dirty, it doesn't mean that you're not accepted or welcomed and that you need to go forever and never come back it just means you need to change it's not that you don't need to be there you just need to be there for them differently you need to get out of those clothes and i get it now look guys some of those clothes you didn't make some of the clothes that you're wearing right now you didn't buy they were given to you a situation or a circumstance may have given you crummy clothes a parent or an uncle or a bad coach or a bad teacher may have given you that crummy shirt. A stranger or an injury or some life event may have given you those old rags. And for some of us, though, we have absolutely convinced ourselves. We believe that we are sentenced forever 
to wear those old ratty clothes for our entire lifetime. That's a lie. That is a lie. Some of the clothes we never asked for, some of the clothes that we have we never wanted, but they were given to us anyway. There was nothing that we did in some instances to ever even deserve those kinds of clothes. Some of us have been wearing that old shirt so long that we don't even notice it now. You know, and, and, and maybe you've just always, you know, raised your voice. Maybe you've just always been sarcastic. Maybe you have just always given impulsive and harsh criticism, but you don't even notice it now. You know what? Maybe you didn't know there is clothing offered to you that is clean and it is different and it fits who Christ says you are much better and more perfectly than those old rags that you're wearing right now. Now look, guys, admittedly, the new might be uncomfortable at first, but it truly fits you better and you will feel better because of the cleanliness and the forgiveness of the fabric. So James says, hey, man, you need to change. He's, he's like, you need to, you need to get out of those old clothes. But it's not a mandate, and it's not in anger, and it's not judgmental. It's repentance language with the idea being this. It's not just a sin that you're offending other people with how you treat them or how you speak to them. But it's a sin against God, too. And listen, saying it that way makes it sound like, oh, man, but I just want to tell you, look, it's not too much or too big for God. Like everything else, when we wrong each other and when we wrong God, we just need to repent. We need to change. And then we go to verse 21. Back here again, after telling them to get rid of these things, he says this, how? He answers the how of this. How do we do it? We, we've tried to change ourselves before, and that never worked. I mean, we didn't have the power. It didn't last. It, it, it never really worked out. I went back to doing it again. So how? Well, verse 21, I think, holds this key. It says this, And humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. So here's the phrase that I think unlocks the how for us in all of this. It says, humbly accept. Look, so much of anger, guys, is rooted in pride it is rooted in selfishness and so James says this he says if you want to have this blessing for God if you want to experience God's power to save and change your life then you have to move from pridefully demanding your way to humbly accepting his way now that has the power to save amen it has the power to save our souls, yes, but it also has the power to save our health or the power to save our relationships with our ch children or the power to save our friendships with each other. And then James gets even a little more personal and goes a little deeper. In verse 22, he says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You got to do what it says. Don't just hear these words about anger and then in a moment forget about it and then do whatever you feel like doing, do what it says. James says, otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. James goes on to say this, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and then you forget what you look like. And then he goes on to say, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, if you look carefully into God's word, it's what he's saying. If you look carefully into God's ways, and then he says, and you do what it says, and don't forget what you've heard. What he's saying there is that you're putting it into practice, right? You're not forgetting what you heard. You're putting it into practice. Then listen to this. God will bless you for doing it. So James uses this visual of a mirror and he says, you know, part of humbly accepting God's word is that you're going to look into that mirror and you're going to be honest with what you see. Now, guys, that's hard. That is hard for a lot of us to do. I mean, a lot of us look in the mirror and we have a hard time telling the truth about ourselves to ourselves. And we really only see what we want to see. I mean... We have a hard time seeing the bad, but I'm not just talking about the bad. 
We also have a hard time seeing the good in ourselves as well. <laughs> Here, when I was in the sixth grade, I'm, I'm going to approach the camera, okay? Don't freak out. When I was in the sixth grade, Miss Bogle was cutting my hair. Now, I want y'all, do y'all see this ear right here? Is that too close, Stephanie? It's pretty close, isn't it? It's good? Okay. Y'all see my left ear? You see my right ear? See how? Okay, see, Miss, Miss Bogle was cutting my hair in sixth grade. Remember that, right? And she just is behind me, and she's staring at the mirror, and then she's just staring at me in the mirror. I mean, it makes me completely uncomfortable. I mean, she's just staring at like, it's like for hours, just staring there. And then she pulls my left ear like that, and then she says, huh. I mean, I'm like, what? And then she's like, did you know that your left ear sticks out more than your right ear? Now, every, now, when I meet you from here going forward, everyone's going to look at my left ear, right? I mean, I know y'all are, right? Y'all probably already noticed it. But then that's, what, that's, what, that's what she said. And I was like, why would you say that to somebody? But, but I asked her, I was like, can you fix it? And she's like, well, no, I, I can't fix it. I, I just thought you'd like to know. Man, for 43 years, guys. <laughs> 43 years, every morning that I get up, I look at my left ear. I did all kinds of things to try to fix that, you know. I would try to purposely sleep on my left side, you know, as I was in junior high and high school. I remember uh, stealing my sister's Fila uh, headband. Remember the red, white, and blue one that Bjorn Borg wore, you know, back in the I stole that, and I would pull it down over my ears just to see if I could crease it back a little bit so that God would, you know, wouldn't stick out like my left Dumbo ear. You know, now every time I look at him, I just see this left Dumbo ear like a, like a car door just open with the other car doors shut, you know. It's maddening, you know, to look at that. Oh, man. I asked my mom. I was like, Mom, did you know about this? She's like, yeah, of course. I'm surprised it took you so long to notice. <laughs> like everyone knew but me. See, the thing is, is that sometimes... We look in the mirror, and we don't notice things that we should. <laughs> and, and that other people have probably noticed all along. And this is especially true when it comes to anger. We don't recognize it in ourselves usually. But the people around us, oh man, <laughs> right? They see it. And they might not tell you. You know why they don't tell you? Because what? You get angry, right? So James says, look, if all you do is listen to this message... If all you do is sit and take notes and nod your head in agreement, then this afternoon your home is filled with angry words and people shouting over each other and raised voices and everyone is talking over the top of each other and no one is listening, then guess what? You're just fooling yourself if you think you got it. See, James knows that this topic is one of those things that you can talk about and that you can agree with in the moment, but once your fuse gets lit... It's really hard to put into practice. And you know what? There's a reason for that. There is actually a scientific, biological reason for that. Once you become angry, guess what happens? You literally start losing the ability to think rationally about what you say and about what you do. It's biology. Here's what happens in your brain when you get angry. The reflexive back areas of your brain called the amygdala, right? They, they start to take over. And your rational prefrontal lobe starts to shut down then the left hemisphere of your brain becomes more stimulated and then all of this hormonal and cardiovascular stuff starts going on in response and it all kicks in and then your blood flow is actually redirected and diverted to your muscles because your body is preparing itself for action right anger tells your body look it's not time to stop and think uh-uh that day's over it's time for you to either fight or hit the bushes, right? So with that in mind, I just want to give you one simple word based on our text today to remember. Stop. The word is stop. So in our minds, if we could just get this image that Stephanie's putting up of a stop sign, right? When you start to feel angry, if you just pull this image up in your mind, and this is what you focus on in your mind. See, if you went to an anger management class, which I've been to plenty, <laughs> one of the techniques that they would teach you is called thought 
stopping. Very, very popular, very commonly used term in anger management. But guess what? It's also very much rooted in Scripture. It's the idea of taking your every thought captive, of being intentional to control your thoughts early enough to catch things early enough before they start spiraling out of control and you do and say something that you didn't mean or that you will regret. And so in your mind, guys, I, I just wonder, can we pull up the word stop and then think about this? What is the next right thing that I need to do right now to make sure that I am living the kind of life that my Lord and Savior wants me to live? Now, look, there's a lot of different stages of anger depending on where you look, anywhere from 3 to probably 12. I, I condensed them into four for us. And as I close this morning, I just want to just tell you that this would be, uh, I'm going to do four of these. The first would be mild inner irritation, which is, that's what it's called. It's where many of us generally live these days, right? It's the kids being loud in the house, or it's the charger cord that mysteriously stops working, or it's choosing the wrong line always consistently at the grocery store. It's being in your 30-second Zoom meeting for the day. That's mild irritation. That leads to stage number two, which is what I term provoked frustration. It's a deeper level of intensity. It feels like what is happening to you is just a little more intentional and a little more personal. It's a little more ill-willed. It feels that way maybe. Uh, mild ir irritation is somebody pulling out in front of you while you're driving. Provoked frustration is when the person who pulls out of you is driving a Hummer with a University of Texas bumper sticker on it. <laughs> It crosses the line, right? <laughs> now, they're, 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 here's the thing about these two stages, right? Uh, the mild irritation and provoked frustration. Both of these stages are what they call thought stages. In other words, the anger that you're feeling is happening mostly in your head. You haven't said anything. You haven't done anything. It's, it's just in your head, right? But then the next stage of anger We'll call this one personal indignation. Personal indignation. This is where it becomes now super personal. You feel personally attacked or you feel personally disrespected or you feel personally mistreated. And look, a lot of us may feel this a little bit more these days since we're just spending so much time with the same people. But see, here's the challenge. Personal indignation goes from the thought stage to the speech stage which leads us to the fourth stage uncontrollable rage now this is the action stage you have thought speech and action and this is where you say things and you do things that you thought you would never do see the challenge for us is to do our thought stopping in the thought stage. When we start to feel the mild irritation and the provoked frustration, before we get to the speech stage, we stop and we take our thoughts, we take them captive, right? Because, look, the tendency is to think, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm, and then all of a sudden, guess what? I'm not okay. And the whole situation has escalated. So James is saying this, be quick to listen and slow to speak. So another thing that we can stop is sometimes is talking. <laughs> Just stop talking. James knows that once we start talking, we're not listening. And look, the idea on listening here is this. Listening is not a passive act for us. Rather, it is this idea of chasing something, of pursuing something, of seeking and searching something out, of chasing it down. See, it's the difference between hearing something and listening for something. When you're listening for something, you're eliminating all these other noises to listen for it. You're intently leaning in. If you want to be quick to listen and you want to be slow to speak and you want to be slow to anger, a great way to do that, guys, is by asking really super thoughtful, good questions. I would 
encourage you guys to try it this week. Lean into the conversation. Listen, and then just ask a few questions and watch how it disarms the other person that may be upset. I mean, you may want to try this today. I mean, I bet you'll have a chance to do it, right? Some of us, you get into a little bit of an argument or a situation becomes a bit tense or someone is expressing themselves just a little too aggressively for your taste. And instead of reacting and responding in kind to that, just maybe listen and ask questions to better understand how they are feeling what they are trying to say. You know you're not doing this if you're constantly talking over the top of them. You know you're not doing this if while they're talking you're already thinking about the next thing that you're about to say to them. So let's just try to find some time this week or even today to ask some thoughtful questions of people that may be a little teed up around us. You know, you can ask them to your spouse, or you can ask them to your kids. I mean, if you really want to throw your students off, man, you want to freak them out, when they're expressing some frustration to you, ask them questions to better understand how they feel. Now, students, listen, that would be kind of weird, but you really want to be super, super tricky. If you really want to throw that entire thing off, students, <laughs> ask your parents or your grandparents, some really good questions when they're lecturing you or talking to you or, 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 or frustrated with you to better understand what it is exactly that they're trying to express to you. So James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. I think in all we can just say this, it's almost like a, a railroad crossing, right? Stop and listen. Stop and look. Look at yourself in the mirror. Take an honest assessment. It's, it's what we want to do here in the next few minutes because we're going to do the love feast uh, together. Uh, we're we're, we're going to, you know, do uh, John Wesley's love, love feast together. And so if you've got some bread and juice, I, I, what I brought was I brought some pizza, some leftover pizza. I got a couple of Cokes here. It doesn't matter what the elements are, you know. You could find any elements, chips or work, whatever you have. They're water. But, but what we want to do is we want to take some time to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross because when we think about what he did for us on the cross, guys, and we look at ourselves in the mirror, it leads us to repentance. Now, look, the Bible says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. So when we deserved anger, guess what we got? God gave us grace instead. And when we recognize his grace and his kindness, it disarms our anger. And it allows us to give that same kind of grace, that same kind of kindness to other people. And so just for the next few minutes, I want us to think about Jesus on the cross. Remember, when Jesus died, he had every right to be angry. Because, look, um, he wasn't just right. <laughs> Jesus was perfect. And yet, think about how he responded. The Bible says that he was silent before his accusers. He didn't have to be. The Bible says when he was on the cross, he spoke forgiveness and grace. He didn't have to say that. Remember, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When Jesus had every right to be angry, he gave grace. He gave it to them. And guess what? He gives it to you, and he gives it to me. And now that we have that grace, it was intended always to overflow out of our own hearts and lives onto others that are around us. So as we remember what he did for us, allow it to work inside of you to do the same for others so well, here's what i'm going to do i'm just going to pray and, and carol and wendy are going to come up and they're going to uh sing our our last song it's a beautiful hymn that they're going to do and as they're singing that i just want you to spend some time in your homes i want you to share in the elements that you're uh that you're that you've elected to share with each other and breaking uh in, in communion in your own homes there and I want you to take some time to pray during this last song. And I want you to remember what Christ has done.
for you. So as they come to start playing and we sing this last hymn together, enjoy the love feast together. But let that joy and grace overflow out of you, not anger. The love and joy and grace that God gave you flow out of you onto each other. Let us pray. God, thank you for your grace, Father. The, the grace that you've given us through Jesus, I thank you that in him we find your kindness and your mercy. And I pray, God, that in these next few minutes, you would allow us to respond to you and to each other the same way, that we would be kind and merciful, God, that you would give us the courage at some point today to stop and take a look in that mirror and just ask ourselves maybe some very hard questions and really try to, ignore, to diagnose how, how are we doing in this area and how we're treating others in, in, in our anger. Because, Lord, we just know that it just takes one person around us, Lord, to spread that infection, either throughout a home or throughout a family or throughout a group or, or friends, e even online. It's not exempt, God. So I pray, God, in the next few minutes that we thank God about your tenderness and we think about your kindness and we think about your mercy that you have given us and expressed to us through what your son did for us you would fill our hearts up with all of that God Lord let it overflow from us onto others it's in your name we pray Amen. There's a song in every silence seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until its season, something God
thank you guys. That's awesome. I did, I, you know, I looked at my phone as uh, uh, they were singing. I just see if I had our sound right. And Marlene, thank Marlene sent me a text, and here's what she told me. Todd, your ears look just fine. So <laughs> thank you for telling me that, Marlene. I sure appreciate it. Guys, I love you very much. I'm so glad that you were here. Uh, remember our care team, all that we have coming up. Go to our Facebook page or our website or our YouTube page as well. Uh, we just want you to be a part of everything that we are offering and that we are doing. And until we see you again, remember Jeremiah 29, 11, but also love, grow, and go, guys. Spill out all the love that you have received from God onto other people uh, this week. Stop and look. Stop and listen. I love you very much. God loves you more. Great having all of you with, with us today. Bye, guys. I hope you have a really wonderful afternoon in a great week.